discussion on alternative assets and private markets. Over the course of the next 60 minutes, we're going to bring you the latest trends and drivers from this area. We've got an expert panel with panelists, uh, one in Geneva, Tom Lawrence over in Geneva, and the rest of our panel in London. Uh, so we're delighted to bring you some heavyweight expertise uh, this afternoon, and I hope you really enjoyed the session. As always, with PCD content, we love to hear from our audience. Uh, those on YouTube, please get involved with uh, in the chat with the comments, questions, thoughts as we move through this session, and I will bring those comments immediately uh, to the attention of our panelists who will attempt to give you uh, their best answer. So uh, looking forward to a great hour ahead. Before we get into the discussion, I'm just going to invite each of our panelists to introduce themselves and to explain a little bit about how they uh, connect to this area of uh, private markets or alternative assets. Perhaps Tom Lawrence at Schroeder's in Geneva, you could get us underway with an introduction. Welcome, Tom. Hi, thanks so much, David. Um, absolutely. I am Thomas Lawrence. I work at Schroeder's in Geneva. I moved over from London last year. Um, I've been with the business since 2010. And in that time, I um, have look looked after private clients and trusts, um, but also been involved on the private asset side um, in terms of research. So that's where I um, become more relevant Great. here. Looking forward to getting into a little bit more detail shortly. Uh, Beth Ann Waters from uh, Farrow & Co in London. Welcome, Beth Ann. Hi, David. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm a partner in the banking and financial services team here at Farrah's. Um, and given the variety of our practice areas, I seem to have developed a specialism over the last 10 or 12 years since I've been here um, in kind of lending against and taking security against more alternative assets and, and particularly luxury assets. Um, and a lot of our clients are, are sort of interested in investing in this area as well. Fantastic. Great to have you with us. Um, next up, uh, Louise Taylor from Rockpool Investments. Welcome, Louise. Hi there. So, yeah, Louise Taylor, I'm a relationship director and a partner at Rockpool Investments. And Rockpool is a private equity firm. And my role within the firm, I've been here since 2013. I work entirely with private clients and occasionally their intermediaries, um, helping them develop portfolios, helping them understand our investment propositions uh, and uh, giving them the wonderful news when they have a fantastic exit. The best job. <laughs> Looking forward to delving into some of the detail on, on those exits and your uh, your role in helping those clients. So look forward to that, Louise. And, and last but not least, Richard uh, Sankey from Argenta Private Capital in London. Welcome, Richard. Uh, David, good afternoon. Yes, uh, I work for Argenta Private Capital, as you say, in business development. I've been with the firm about two years. And before that, I was working in sort of mainstream wealth management. Uh, and Argenta are one of three what they call members agents now that can advise private uh, investors in the Lloyds insurance market. So we advise on about three billion of private and corporate capital that supports underwriting uh, in the Lloyds insurance market. Terrific. And there's a lot of misconceptions there to challenge. Isn't it? We'll get into the detail, Richard, but I think uh, I look forward to, uh, to lifting the lid on that uh, through the session. So thank you. So, Tom, just starting, just starting with you, um, uh, the, just the, take the label of private markets. You're part of that, the team there at Schroeder's looking at these assets. What kind of investment opportunities would you put in this category? What, if people are looking at this area, what kind of uh, investment opportunities might they find? Give us a sense of the breadth of opportunity. Absolutely. Well, it's well worth asking because there's no one fixed definition of uh, what private markets are. And clearly it could include anything really that isn't listed. Um, traditionally, private assets tends to comprise private equity. So investing in unlisted companies, private debt, which is, again, unlisted debt, um, infrastructure and property. Uh, but that's not a definitive list by any means. Um, I'm, I should probably say, um, uh, you know, that. Uh, no, actually, I'm going to I'm going to stop there because I'll preempt myself. Okay, not a problem. And and, and where do, where does some of the sort of deal flow for, from Schroders originate? Do you, uh, how do you pick up on the on the private market investment opportunities that might come across your desk or that you might talk to clients about? Uh, it's again interesting. So I, there's a there's a broad range actually. So 
internally we have a great deal of expertise in the area and can and pick out individual deals there we've got a range of trusted partners we also have corporate relationships with placement agents and not actually not forgetting our client base as well who often have f fascinating insights into the area so it's it's a really broad range i think the key thing is the breadth of one's network um, mm. but also ensuring the scope for proper in-depth due diligence once you've identified those potential deals and is there a sort of ticket size you tend, tend to work on? What's the kind of range of different uh, deal sizes you might be working in this space? Well, it, 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 it depends a great deal. I mean, there are different types of deals. So, for instance, if one's going into a limited partnership, the, the minimums tend to be significantly higher. But equally, there are there are other means of entering. So, for instance, investment trusts where, you know, essentially there is no minimum. So and people talk a great deal about the democratization of private private assets. And there is probably more to more to come on that road. But um, it's definitely a lot more accessible for the right kind of investor than it used to be. And. How do you think that investors should approach this area, thinking about liquidity, time horizon? If they're less experienced in this space, they've they've invested and perhaps they've run their own business, they've had a liquidity event, they're investing in public markets, but they're being, you know, they're considering other types of investment. What should a sort of uh, less experienced investor be be thinking about when they're looking at this kind of asset class? It's, it's a really good point, and it's absolutely crucial to this asset class as one of the few unifying features is that it's generally extremely illiquid. Um, so it's definitely not for all investors. So, for instance, I mentioned fixed life funds in private equity. Typically, they can have a, an investment life of over 10 years or so, um, at which, uh, you know, there's no guaranteed secondary market. And even if there is, you probably would need to sell at some kind of discount to the current value of the investment. So I think the key thing is to be really clear with investment clients at the outset about this. Um, it may not make for an easy conversation, but it's better to have an awkward conversation now than in five years time. Um, uh, but for all that, for the right client who can tolerate that illiquidity and has the right time horizon, the benefits are it can be really significant. I mean, is the time, could the time horizon be 10 years plus? Is that, is that the way people should be thinking about this? More like a pension type asset rather than something that they might need to uh, to liquidate if they if they have other if there's other things in their business or personal life that they need to finance I, I think you're right. Well, I, technically, it's quite difficult to get private equity into pensions, but certainly a kind of long, that kind of long, if you've got that kind of time horizon, that's the kind of thing you should be thinking about. If it's more three to five years or even less, then it's definitely not the right investment for you because you're just not going to be very easy. It's not going to be very easy to get your money out. And, and what about on the principles of, in, in public markets, people look at diversification as, 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 a, as a core principle to, to, for managing risk. Do you think in the area of private markets, different principles apply? People get to know certain industries well, and that knowledge actually helps them on their, their journey. Are there, are there different considerations over which people would invest in this way versus the, the public market? Yeah, I, th I think that there are probably two sides of it. I mean, diversification is every bit as key as in any other kind of investing. Um, and actually, there are probably mm. an extra couple of layers to think about. So, and the illiquidity means that you can't shop and change on such a tactical basis. So you do have to come up with long-term decisions that you can stand by for the long term. So that's where diversification becomes key. So you've got diversification by sector, of course, manager, type of investment, but also the vintage. Uh, long-term mm. private equity returns tend to be very strong, but it, it varies enormously on your entry point. Um, if you'd invested in 2006, the credit crunch would have meant your annualized returns were probably pretty weak, whereas a year or two later and the returns would have been spectacular. So the key is to have a spread, we'd say a minimum of four or five vintages, ideally more, um, which given each one can be a 10 plus year life to, lifetime, this is particularly talking about private equity, but it does apply more broadly. Um, mm. That only magnifies the point about liquidity and understanding the long-term nature of the investment. Um, but that said, I should add that that's not to say that concentration and sector specialism isn't a good thing. I mean, it, you do get managers who consider themselves to be jacks of all trades, but mm. increasingly people are looking for sector expertise where the information is more scarce. You get in-house expertise that can in certain areas that can reduce costs and increase efficiency. And there are synergies across the portfolios where, where similar companies are held. Um, so, you know, and, and we feel that, you know, that often that can help grow the company more organically um, over time. So specific knowledge is certainly no bad thing as long as you're making sure it's part of a diversified portfolio. Okay, thanks. And, and what are the kind of macro uh, conditions in the economy that is leading to more and more uh, 
um, investment into into private markets. What do you think? What, what, why has the, the the macro conditions kind of led to more interest and demand in this space? Yeah, I, I, I think again there, there there are a couple of points to be made. The first is an acknowledgement that returns from traditional asset classes are likely to be lower over the next few years, and private assets can often provide a premium there. Um, mm. uh, I, I mean, by by our estimates, again, no one should rely on this. Full of caveats of, of the usual um, usual kind about past performance, but we generally expect a kind of a three percent premium on top of what you might be able to get out of um, listed equivalents after all costs. Um, but it's not just a case of chasing those high risk. Returns, although there's obviously no, that's no bad thing in itself. Um, it's also a slight reaction to the, it's the structural change we've seen. We've seen more companies staying private for longer. Businesses tend to be less capital intensive, and the founders and early shareholders look to keep as much of that high early stage growth to themselves before coming to public markets. And at the other end of the spectrum, we've got more and more large public companies being taken private. Um, and we've seen a good deal of that in the UK over the last year or two. So the net result is that public markets are narrowing. Um, which can't be a good thing for the average public equity investor and hence trying to reclaim some of that lost ground by investing in private assets. So to higher returns, yes, but also a reaction to what a structural change we've seen in the investment landscape. OK, well, thank you very much for that, Tom, for getting us underway. I'm just going to bring um, Bethan Waters in. Um, Bethan, we heard from Tom there increased demand in, in private market investments. Is this something that you've, you've picked up and observed um, too in your practice? Yeah, very much so. Um, I think both on the debt, uh, the debt side that I'm involved with, and on the equity side, um, obviously uh, there are lots of opportunities of, to invest in private entities at an early stage. You know, startups and things like that. But we seem to be seeing it a lot more at a, either at a growth stage, sort of just just below the 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 level where the venture capitalists like to come in. There's a kind of gap there where there is a lot of investment going on at the moment. Um, in terms of asset classes, uh, it's interesting that, that Tom mentioned a few um, at the start of his talk. We, we've done a lot of work recently in real estate, healthcare, assisted living, um, those sort of projects. But then I've been involved with a hotel uh, investment recently, actually two hotels, a restaurant group and um, like a film special effects company. Um, so slightly broader type of asset mm. class. I mean, I think the 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 challenge that we're seeing amongst some of our clients who are at that slightly below the the big uh, private equity fund level is how they can those private investors can compete with mm. with the big funds um, mm. and uh, who are obviously becoming more an act- active in these these markets and lots of that wealth and capital coming from the the US and then the tension mm. on the debt side with with more institutional in, um, more in, in sorry institutional lenders and, and debt providers uh, kind of competing against initial um, private lenders. Mm. Um, and so you 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 mentioned you're seeing opportunities there around real estate hotels. Are these people where there's opportunities through COVID that have been seen and they're quickly like looking at capitalising on that opportunity because it's not things you necessarily expect, is it? Have, have you seen that coming through? Uh, I think that's right, and I think yeah. um, I think part part of that is is you know there's been banks and um, and a nervousness around more inflexible institutions to um, invest in or or lend to these kind of um, these kind of asset classes, whereby actually somebody who's a bit more nimble, an investor who's got a bit more of an appetite for risk um, or return mm-hmm. is, is able to fill the gap. And there's, there is a lot of, I mean, just walking down Oxford Street yesterday, there's a lot of property that that is empty or, mm. or is is uh, opportunity to, to be there. And, you know, in, in these kind of markets, there's always opportunities that somebody is willing to take advantage of. And yeah, definitely we're, we're seeing private arrangements for for quite big projects that that you wouldn't have typically expected to see being done on a private basis so. okay and how might some of these projects be be put together and structured for for co- to facilitate this kind of co-investment so it's usually a combination of sort of tax structuring corporate structuring sometimes bringing in debt um depends on the the, the type of investor and the the lead investor and where mm-hmm. they're located um, the flexibility of having to bring in lots of different partners. You know, sometimes there's passive investors who who just want the lead investor to get on with it. Uh, sometimes we need to create 
um, structures to allow different uh, investors to have equivalent control or pro rata control or some more than others. So we will help out with that setting up vehicles. I mean, we as a firm only do it in the UK, but we have um, partners across across the world who we can work with to, to set that up if it's an international entity. And I think also the regulatory um, the regulatory aspect, we help with that because sometimes we're seeing more and more SPVs be set up to, to put these uh, special private investments mm. in and ring fence those um, for future purposes. So there's, there's lots of stuff going on out there. Yeah, because they, they might be structured as, as through a corporate or partnership. or f- I mean, there's also a lot of talk about fund structures being used in certain circumstances. Um, I mean, how do you see the private fund side um, coming into play and, and being used, where does that create value above more simplistic corporate structuring? I, would say? Um, I think, I mean, it's not, it's not particularly my area, but right. I think it, it can be, uh, it can be helpful from a tax perspective. It can be helpful from a future proofing perspective in terms of mm-hmm. if, if there's a, a likelihood of future investment um, and uh, things like that. And, and obviously it's from a regulatory uh, perspective, sometimes in certain uh, areas like such as insurance and and pensions there are regulatory requirements that have to be satisfied so um depending on what the sector is i think funds have their their positives and and negatives and uh, obviously we we look at that on a case by case basis as to whether it's appropriate no sure. i mean do you think that um investors can underestimate the risks of informal arrangements you know pe- families that have known each other or feel they've got some understanding you know and and these arrangements really unraveling when the going gets tough so what's your what's your warning label on 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 informal arrangements for private investors yeah i mean very very much so we we see that uh, a lot um sometimes there's sort of informal arrangements that are usually actually especially amongst the very wealthy families or big family offices you know quite informal or unsophisticated arrangements get put in place at the the beginning and uh, valuations are quite low so it doesn't seem quite important informal processes you know over depending on the culture of the of the actual you know families involved or the the investors involved you know very very informal arrangements um based on promises that are given to you know developers or individuals and then they the you said as as the investment grows or the the business grows the investors seek to rely on those those arrangements and and sometimes uh that can affect the ability for further investment or for um you know for for some sort of tax reliefs that that may be available to be claimed because the right processes haven't been put in place um, at the start. And and on the debt side, I'd say, and I'm doing something at the moment that's Mm. requiring quite a lot of this. I think a business, when it it grows, you know, scrabbling together investments from different investors um, on the the private side is great. And, you know, somebody's prepared to give in this much money, somebody's prepared to loan us that much money. And then you get to a point where the business has grown and you need some sort of a, a, another round of, of debt. But the, the the offerings that you've given to all of your different investors are uh, such a complicated um, mm. mesh of different layers of restrictions and um and sort of interest rates or whatever that you need to to really sit back and think well how can we unpick all of this or how can we make this simpler because I think sometimes in the rush and excitement to get something up and running and especially with with small businesses they don't want to incur a huge uh, amount of advisory costs when Mm. they're actually quite a small business but then the cost of sort of unpicking that at a later stage can can be a bit of a, a problem. So I think in terms of a, a tip, I'd say just, just sort of try and take a step back, think a bit more holistically and think about, as Tom said, the, the kind of end game and, and how, mm. how the exit might look like and, and what the, you know, from an investor's point of view is how does how do you see this, this working out? Um, and actually I've seen a, a relationship go very sour, you know, it started off as a very familial relationship. You know, everybody wants to invest in this company, build it well, COVID happened, the business changed quite a lot. The relationships have now soured quite a lot and, and everybody's looking for an exit that isn't really very easy to establish because the right, it was done a bit in the rush at the start. So, yeah. 
take a breath, I'd say. Yeah, and, and I guess, uh, Farah, you're working alongside colleagues in family law and, and private client as well that have, there's consequences here to think about, particularly you're talking about high value investments. There might yeah. be all sorts of things come left, from divorce, death, succession planning generally. So it must, yeah. you know, getting yeah. a realistic view is important, isn't it? Very much so, because one of the things I get told a lot as a, as a finance lawyer is it's a very friendly arrangement. Everybody's yeah. happy with it. We don't want we don't want anything more than two pages. And then sort of five years down the line, they've all fallen out with each other. Um, that why have we only got this two page document? So. So, yeah, I think I think it is. Um, and the circumstances around you know, these are people's lives a lot of the mm. a lot of the case and because they are private companies owned often by individuals or families those the the sort of macro circumstances around those families and lives and businesses are all intertwined and you can't you can't escape that in a in a privately owned business mm. where with private investors coming in who are often investing in the people rather than just the business Mm, no, yeah. interesting. And on the financing side, you mentioned dealing on a broad range of, of luxury assets. Perhaps you could give us a sense of, you know, if using those kind of assets as collateral in, in, in investments, or what are some of the considerations around the financing side on the luxury asset piece? Uh, I think it depends on the, the assets that, mm. that is being offered as a collateral. Uh, it's interesting what Tom said earlier about, um, you know, it, it, it being a bit harder to ob- obtain um you know, value out of traditional assets. And, and we do see people turning to these alternative assets to try and A, make money. I think I think investment managers have realized that these clients are sitting on huge, huge portfolios of, you know, arts and cars and, and things that are worth a lot of money. And um, so from their perspective, it's it's good to leverage those up and use some of the liquidity in that to, to invest in other things. Um, as a lender, we often advise um, against secure against artwork. So obviously things like provenance and title and mm. um, and just really doing your due diligence on on that sort of stuff before you um, before you actually lend against it. I mean, obviously. I think the rewards are there, but you do have to go, and that's why a lot of bank lenders aren't so keen on doing it, is that you have to do a little bit of extra extra checking um, in terms of the asset that you're lending against and um, and be sure that it, it, it's um, it's what you want to invest in. A lot of lenders don't have the appetite for risk, but but actually, you know, uh, recently I've I've done something for a, a bank lender actually where it's um, they took por- a portfolio of art security in addition to for, for an individual who owned some companies that had all sorts of other asset security they decided to enforce against the art rather than some of the other security and the art the um, because it was easier and quicker and actually the the sales of the art did so well that they were able to pay down not just the loan that the art was primarily in security for but another um loan as well so mm. it can work very well but there mm. is more risk there and obviously there's a physical risk that somebody you know you want to make sure it's safely stored um and insured and all of that stuff so Great. just finally beth i mean you mentioned at the start that the um inflows into the uk from us private equity for example you know the the weakness in the pound i guess and and the general environment in the uk making there be opportunities for investors do you think the uk remains a good place to attract investment and to you know be be a you know an attractive um venue for international investors to come and, and build companies up and spend money it certainly seems that way at the, at the moment from from what we're seeing i think um actually most of my team if i look around are doing us um it deals based on U.S. investment, um, yeah. big money coming from the West Coast. Um, so I think there is still a degree of um, a degree of attractiveness from the U.S. Uh, coming in. Who, who knows what the future will hold with all of yeah. the horribleness that's going on at the moment? But um, yeah, hopefully. Thank you, Tom. What's your perspective, uh, Tom Lawrence? What's your perspective on that on that question? Is is a lot of the the uh, the private equity deals that you see um, a lot of U.S. investors looking at UK? Uh, corporate targets what's your what's your perception on that trend so, certainly there's been a bit been a lot more interest um partly i think because the uk um uh, presents a, a pretty compelling value opposition there a, a proposition there are 
you know, plenty of well-run companies and there mm. are plenty of private, US private equity firms that are awash with cash. Um, mm. And yeah, I think it's, it's just a question of where the cash is and where the opportunities lie. So I think we'll probably see more on that theme um, over, over the coming years. And, and what's the view from Geneva on companies, say, across European private markets? Are there certain parts of the European economy that's more exciting than others? Mm. Or is it in each in each jurisdiction there's there's bright spots and, and good little companies to talk about? Or what, what's your what's the view think, from Geneva? Slightly different, isn't it, to a UK central yeah. view? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think both are true. There are inevitably, so you know, interesting companies within each. You know, as you say, those those bright spots within each region. But also, what you have in Europe in terms of opportunity is, um, you often end up with with quite fragmented um, industries. You have lots of family-owned companies that potentially have succession planning issues. So actually, mm-hmm. all of the all of these things make it kind of ripe opportunity for private equity firms to to come in and potentially help families release capital from their firms, um, uh, kind of revise how they've been going about things, which potentially might not have changed much over the last few years, that kind of thing actually makes, there are some really compelling opportunities in Europe as well, yeah. Okay, terrific. Um, just like to bring in uh, Louise from, from Rockwell, kind of building on that on that sentiment really. Uh, Louise, you, you're able to provide access to direct investment opportunities across a diverse range of sectors, tapping into some of these things that, that Tom was saying about, you know, the, the UK corporate landscape being attractive for investors. Um, be interesting to get your view on why you think that small cap space is exciting for investors and what they what they come to you looking for. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's two things there at least, aren't there, David? You know, the direct access, which you mentioned, um, which Tom referred to democratisation of private equity, and we are... Rockpool is a classic example of giving wider access to private equity because we we do a deal by deal approach uh, and enable investors to invest directly rather than through a fund structure. Mm. Therefore, there's a lot more transparency to the underlying asset, the underlying companies that an investor is invested in. And that can have lots of benefits that can have benefit in terms of personal DD. Uh, and, and ensuring that that underlying asset is robust and attractive, um, but but also from the point of view of of, of you know transparency reporting uh, and returns. Mm. So uh, we find increasingly you know sophisticated investors. We we work with high net worth and sophisticated investors choosing to work with professional private equity partners like us to deliver them direct access to deals outside of the fund structure. We have an in-house private equity team, therefore the investor does not need to do the DD. You see, it's, it's like a full service sort of sort of approach. Um, the small cap, your second point about the small cap yeah. size of what we do, that, that's something very specific to Rockpool. Um, Bethan, I think you mentioned this gap in, in, in provision, you know, between the startup and the very big uh, uh, firms, and we are absolutely in that gap. Uh, and 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 that's a, a big reason I think for our success over the last ten years. What that really means is investing it, um, around about sort of six to ten million per company. Uh, companies that are turning over between five and thirty million pounds. Um, for us, they have to be already profitable businesses, so they're mm-hmm. making at least a million, a million and a half EBITDA at the point at which we we invest. Um, and that's that's why high net worth investors get excited because, mm. of course, by partnering with us in investing in these companies, they are backing entrepreneur, entrepreneurial energy. We're helping to sort of unleash that that entrepreneurial spirit by giving partnership and giving money to support growth. Um, and it, you know, it's an awful lot more fun. And I, I think that's the other thing you, you can't lose track of with 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 private markets. Is it is an opportunity to sort of really energize investors through direct contact with something that they really enjoy. And that's that's obviously you know something that I get a lot from my clients. Can it have a feeling of a grown-up sort of dragon's den? I mean, it's not a direct link, but do you think that the people like looking at specific businesses and then saying, yes, I like that flavor or or not? Is that yeah. part of the mix? It, it definitely is, you know, and, and, and we have a really, uh, quite, luckily, quite a well-developed method for, for, for helping to answer the really quite complex questions. And certainly I can answer a lot of, the, a lot of them, but I might well have to refer uh, back to the, the more detailed model or the investment team for some of that. And we've got a very good responsive get back within 24 hours. You know, there's a three week d- uh, period this, because it's deal by deal. It really mm. keeps us on our toes. We, we're working to a deadline. We start from zero. 
uh, and we have to interact, we need to interact with, with clients in order to get to that, that, that funding deadline. How, how much deal flow, how many companies come across the desk of the, the teams analysing these opportunities across the course of, of a year, say? I mean, what, what's the sort of quantum of companies you might look at for investment opportunities and def- refine yeah. that down into ones you might actually proceed to uh, take to investors? Yeah, so we would usually proceed with about six or seven a year. Mm. Um, and um, there's obviously a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. Due diligence has been mentioned. That's an incredibly important piece across legal, financial, commercial, and, and of course, the management team, the people that are going to lead the business through the, through the growth. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah. Sorry, just remind me of your question, David. Yeah, I was just saying, how many companies would yeah, you so how many companies? to to, yeah. to, to to Thank funnel you. it down into the actual investable companies, you know, you must look yeah. for a huge... There is. I mean, that, that's the art, isn't it? Not spending yeah. too much time on the yeah. ones that you're not going to take forward. Um, so, and obviously we, we get offered deals from all sorts of places, including our investors. Um, and many of those just, just don't get off the block because they're not yet profitable. So that's a really clear, immediate, easy, you know, criteria and they're too early stage for us. Uh, um, but yeah, maybe... maybe if Sorry. You're, if you're raising money in tranches like this, do you kind of just have dates or like a closing date? And you, yeah. You're communicating yeah. regularly with your investors. How, how yeah. do you kind of, uh, you know, um, run the uh, run the fundraise? Yeah. So so we we are well through the DD by the time we launch the what we call the blueprint, which is the, the investment memorandum. Um, and investors then have a three week period to engage. Some of them may have already made a forward commitment to us. And obviously that's great for us, gives us visibility, gives them more security of allocation. But others who want to absolutely control uh, how much goes into what. And remember, with us, it's not just the equity, it's also private debt opportunities. So they can mm. choose what sort of risk reward they want from us. So, so there's a three week intensive period of calling and, 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 and meetings and all of that sort of thing in order that people can get comfortable with making an investment decision. Um, and, 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 and again, you know, diversification is the key. You know, we, we mm. want to work with investors who want to invest over a period of time, who see private equity as, as an important part of their portfolio uh, and are prepared to, to allocate to it, not necessarily in huge amounts. It's quite accessible. Okay, and uh, many of you deals are um, management buyouts. Um, perhaps you could just explain a little bit about why this matters to investors. Yeah, I so suppose seeing it from an investor point of view, you're, you're always going to want to invest in a business where management is, is, is experienced, knows what they're doing, and is energised. And clearly, if they're going to work with a partner, a funding partner like Rockpool, they've got a plan in mind. It, it may well be a key part of the management team's lifetime wealth creation. Mm. And in that, their interests are obviously completely aligned with, with the investors. Mm. Um, I think a lot of the investors that I work with are entrepreneurs who've successfully mm. ex- built and exited businesses. They might be family offices. And there's a sort of gut connection and understanding of what it means to be a management team of a, of, of a SME. Um, so there is a, a really sort of essential chemical connection there. Um, we've got to talk about returns, you know, yeah. with, 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 um, with, with participating in a management buyout through Rockpool, you'd be looking at three to five times cash return for equity, two times on loan. Um, these companies are already viable and profitable. They've proven that. Um, you know, other people have referred to the, the, the great returns in this mm. part of the market uh, compared with listed markets over long term. Um, because of the businesses that the, the, the management buyouts that we do um, are already profitable, it makes it easier to value the businesses. They have profits, mm. so they can be valued on a multiple of, of, of EBITDA as we would. Um, and they don't just have revenue. They don't just have evidence of a click through appetite from their, you know, burgeoning yeah. audience. These, the, there's, there's cash there. Um, uh, so and, and, and in our part of the market, we tend to buy in at very attractive valuations, meaning around about sort of five, six times EBITDA. And the dry powder that other people have mentioned in the, in the mid market and, mm. and higher up the, the chain in, 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 the, in the private funding world um, those guys are looking for 
robust, good assets. And by the time we've worked with the business for five years and grown that EBITDA to 3 million, 4 million or plus, um, there's a lot more competition and therefore there's a multiple arbitrage opportunity for an investor in coming into these management buyouts. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you for that. There's a question uh, from YouTube for you, Louise, just asking, do Rockpool invest in UK companies or international as well as UK? Or what, what's, the, what's the answer there? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. We are really focused, we're completely focused on the UK, UK SMEs, and that is because there's masses of opportunity here mm -hmm. and it's right under our nose. And obviously we want to maintain a close relationship with the um with the company with the management team throughout the time we invest with them i guess it's like investing in the FTSE. you're still also buying into global companies as well so the the, the uh, uk oh, yeah. companies trading overseas and things like that you're still getting exposure to global growth. yeah thank you david i mean the point yeah. is that they're, they're uk headquartered yeah so you know center of operations is here but multiple companies that we've invested in have um inter obviously it maybe have an international arm we may even be investing in the u.s arm for example uh in in our company um hartley botanic we invest in growth in, in the american market which was very successful um so so yes so so they are all internationally operating companies but uh the management team is located here Excellent. And there is a tax play to, to your, your investment. There's a, there's a tax kicker, if you like, an extra incentive. Perhaps you could just explain how that might work for private investors in the UK. Yeah, it's not the best known EIS. That's, of course, you know, what, what people associate with the earlier stage, earliest, you know, um, um, perhaps more risky businesses. Um, but there are, in fact, a range of reliefs. And there are, of course, other tax efficient structures that an investor could use to hold these, these investments through. Um, we actually developed our own SIP, the Rockpool SIP, because of the challenges that people have mm. in investing, uh, using some of their pension pot to invest in private uh, companies. So we actually set that up ourselves. Um, but there are a, a range of sort of standard reliefs um, that are of interest, perhaps some specifically to UK taxpayers, some specifically to uh, those outside of the UK. Investors relief, as an example, uh, not a very well known one. Um, I often find in conversation with, with investors that they, 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 they need information about it. it. It essentially provides a reduced rate, which is 10% of uh, capital gains tax on profits from uh, unlisted uh, companies, as long as they're subscribed by individuals and held for a minimum of three years. Three years. Mm -hmm. um, now, lifetime uh, capital of ten uh, million. So you know, it's 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 quite an extensive relief. Uh, our hold period is typically four to five years. So generally, uh, they they will qualify, and and that's that's a useful thing. Um, Business relief is another example that everybody will be familiar with. Um, the fact that a, a, a business relief can reduce the value of your estate um, on which inheritance tax is calculated. Um, if you own shares in, in, in UK private companies, two of those shares can fall outside of your estate um, after they've been held for two years. So that's a, a short a qualification period, which can be very useful um, in certain circumstances. Um, and um, there are other ways. We actually have a structure for, for private debt, which qualifies for business relief. So there are a whole range of, of, of possibilities with business relief. Um, maybe it's also just worth mentioning business investment relief, hmm. um, which allows um, non-UK domiciled investors to avoid remittance charges on, on overseas income and gains uh, in, by investing in UK companies. So um, that's, a, that's an unlimited amount uh, that people can bring into, into the UK. Um, on which business investment relief can be can be levied. So, you know, there, there are a whole range and, and think outside of, 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 of EIS, um, which clearly provides an enviable um, set of, uh, um, of, of things, of uh, reliefs. And maybe it's just worth, you know, we touched on risk and obviously there is always risk of loss with, with mm. investing in private companies. Not everything goes to plan. Um, but, but and people sort of, Forget perhaps if they're used to EIS investing, where loss relief is obviously a big part of the the, 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 the helpful relief. Um, but losses on private company share investments can be offset against income and 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 um, and and gains. So that that can be very useful. Yeah. Thank you. It's portfolio. Bethan, just to bring you, do, do you see investors using these tax reliefs widely? I mean, particularly there's that. 
the non-DOMs able to remit um, otherwise taxable income into certain qualifying trades? Do you see these things being used in practice or it's not so much a part of what you're, you're seeing? We, we would always advise people to go and take tax advice before they're either investing in something or if they are about to receive an investment because mm. like Louise said that there are a lot of these reliefs available and, and depending mm. on the type of investment and the investor and their location and all of those things um, I think there are plenty of reliefs available I mean I think the one thing that we see a lot of is people who don't take advice and who 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 aren't aware of these reliefs and you know they've made these investments or they've received these investments and they uh, they haven't taken the advice as I was saying before and then they they currently then they sort of go towards the next round of investment and and the question will get asked and and they'll go oh no no I didn't just I just did it I needed the money or or, or we just made this investment because we thought it was good so you know from our perspective as lawyers we always advise our clients to take to take the advice on the tax the tax angle uh, because it will be different in every single case as well thank you um louise just got a question for you from john sheath uh thank you john for your question on youtube um he's just asking what makes an industry disruptive startup appealing to investors so what what makes a company that's gonna uh, uh, unsettle unsettle the apple cart if you like do you think do, do some of the opportunities you're taking out Louise aim to fundamentally challenge established markets or do they tend to more go with the flow and build on expert? is there any any well, kind of way of that summarizing that answer <laughs> I mean it probably relates to things at a slightly earlier stage than what we're dealing with but right. and, and I suppose we would see Rockpool to some degree as a disruptive agent in, in the private equity market slightly yeah. obviously we're 10 years old now so yeah. it's we're a bit old older and more and what and wise but um yeah I you know I think we have we have companies such as trusted house sitters which is um you know making the most of the trust economy the sharing economy uh in putting pet owners and pet sitters together mm. um that's a membership model uh and and we love that sort of uh, structure that provides a recurring revenue model um, so while it's a disruptive um, agent and it's expanding massively in, in America at the moment with the since COVID or relaxation, it's really it's really taking off massively and as well in the UK. We've got people who travel the world just by being pet sitters through membership of, of, of the platform. Um, so I guess, you know, from an investor point of view, the opportunity to get in early with some of these things and to, and to stay in the long term and, and to uh, really believe in the mission of business mm. if it's looking to innovate you know and in sustainable issues in in in, in humanitarian educational issues which which very much motivate investors particularly in the current context so you know i think that it's a very hard question to answer yeah. and, um, you know I guess it's just about started. diversification isn't it if you've got the diversification some of the disruptors will go and flourish and some will that's right. Away, Some will so fall away, and 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 disruptors create markets, and then other people come into those markets, and you know, develop, extend and develop those markets. I mean, you know, with us, things can be really quite straightforward. You know, mm. we one of our most successful investments was, um, it, which exited last year, um, was um, making posh greenhouses. It's a it's a company called Hartley Botanic, which uh, is it shows at um, Chelsea Flower Show. It's advertises on the back page of the RHS magazine. You know, this is a premium brand, which was really underdeveloped. Mm. Um, we did a, a, a management buy-in into that company uh, in 2016 and grew sales in, um, in America by 367%. There you go, mm. I remember that figure. Um, you know, so, so, and it went from an EBITDA of 1.8 to, to 4.2 million over the time that we invested and delivered a return of 5.7 times. So, you know, sometimes it pays to look at quite straightforward um, nuts and bolts businesses that might have been overlooked by the bigger investors. Terrific. Thank you, Louise. Um, Richard, thank you. Just to bring you in from uh, Argenta Private Capital, we're talking about a whole range of different industries there. The insurance industry is one of our oldest industries in the UK, but I think there's some fundamental misconceptions out there from investors as to why that might be an attractive place to invest. It'd be interesting to get your view as to what your conversations, where your conversations start with investors and how you take them on that journey. 
Yeah, thank you, David. Um, yeah, it's interesting because, as I said, I, I, I'm sort of probably two years into my time at Argenta, having come from mainstream wealth management, where, where to be honest, you know, Lloyd's was not widely discussed and not widely understood. And so it's, it is a relatively complex world. It does take a little bit of time to get your head around. Um, but having done that, I'm really quite sort of taken with the whole concept. And I think if we'd had this conversation 25 years ago, no one would have batted an eyelid because investing at Lloyd's in those days was a very mainstream activity. Mm. There were something like 36,000 names, as they were known. Um, and there were a good number of organisations similar to our called members agents that used to advise them. Now, of course, as everyone is aware, in those days, some very healthy returns were achieved. But what probably wasn't made as clear as it should have been was the fact that this was done on the basis of unlimited liability. Um, and a spate of claims about 25 years ago, including you know, the sinking of the Exxon Valdez and Piper Alpha, for example, meant that suddenly some, some investors who'd done really quite well for a few years were forced to sort of make good on losses and in many cases suffered quite significant uh, you know, financial hardship as a result. That has not been the case since 2003. And I think that is not something, again, that is widely understood that since 2003, so nearly 20 years now, investing at Lloyd's is done through a limited liability vehicle mm. um, and actually returns over the last, you know, since then and certainly over the last decade have been really pretty healthy, um, annualising at about 10% a year. And of course, that is just the return from Lloyd's. And on top of that is the return that would have been achieved by your investment manager um, managing your funds at Lloyd's, which is the investment portfolio that is posted as collateral to support your, your, your activities at Lloyd's. So you combine the returns from both of those. And actually, it's, you know, it is a pretty compelling um, opportunity, not least because of the diversification that Lloyd's offers. You know, mm. If you look at how it's behaved over the years compared to traditional markets, equities, fixed income and the like, actually, it has done, you know, it's behaved very differently. And it's a very good diversifier as a result. Um, I would say, you know, the, the number of people invested at Lloyd's now is, is a lot smaller. It's probably about two and a half thousand overall, but it's still about 10% of the capital that supports uh, the Lloyd's market. Lloyd's has capitalized at about 40 billion sterling and about 4 billion of that comes from private wealth. And that has been pretty steady uh, recent years and I think that's one of the reasons they like it you know corporate money tends to be quite hot it tends to come and go but actually corp uh, private money tends to sort of stick it out through good times and bad mm. um, and you know of late it, it's been pretty good times now the last three years have been lost years not entirely surprisingly with Covid but not just that we've also had various sort of natural catastrophes some wildfires in Australia and California uh, and such like um, but what we are seeing is that actually premium levels have gone up significantly in the last year or so. And the predicted returns for Lloyd's for the next few years are extremely strong um, in the order of up to 20% or so. And of course, now that could be, you know, that may or may not happen, but that is based on increases in premium levels and the modeling that goes on, looking at how various disaster scenarios, if they were to unfold, could affect the market. Um, and so I think they're, they're fairly confident in those numbers. Um, so how do investors um, modify the, the risk they're taking within within like a, a Lloyd's investment? So is it that they stick to certain, they exclude certain sectors or that they, they invest alongside each other? How, how do you how do you talk through with people who are who have different risk yeah. profiles, their comfort and tolerance for loss? Sure. So the, there's about 90 syndicates at Lloyd's and the syndicates at Lloyd's are the parts of the organization that underwrite the risk. Um, they take in the premiums and they provide the insurance cover. Of those 90, about 30 will accept private capital. Mm. So a big part of the work we do at Argenta is the research of those syndicates. And a lot of them will be sort of household names, big blue chip organizations such as Hiscox, Chaucer, Beasley, for example, you know, large listed organizations. Um, and our research team, um, you know, spend their their time talking to these syndicates, meeting with them, understanding their business plans, and then rating them. And it's very much like putting together, a, you know, a typical investment portfolio. So we have syndicates we rate A, B, C, and D. And the D we will not uh, recommend clients attach money to. Um, as you would expect, some of the A syndicates typically are more expensive to get on. 
Um, mm. So sometimes we recommend to clients that they consider some of the low, the, the Bs and the Cs that are available at, at better value. Um, but essentially what we tend to do is put together a, a range of portfolios for clients, possibly 12 to 15 or so, which they support. And those portfolio, those syndicates, some of them will uh, be composite syndicates that will you know, ensure across a wide range of sectors. So potentially natural catastrophes, aviation, marine, oil and gas, for example, some of them might be specialist. Uh, so for example, there is a, a syndicate that purely underwrites nuclear risk. Mm. Um, and so we will just, so we can bespoke this. So we will sit down with clients uh, and we will design a, you know, a portfolio supporting syndicates that meets their, their sort of appetite for risk. In terms of correlation to public markets, I mean, when you're looking at this, are you able to show clients looking for true diversification that uh, versus um, portfolios in the FTSE or otherwise that, that these, the Lloyds market just doesn't move in the same in the same direction, which was when the great financial crisis, global financial crisis, people found that assets all moved in the in the same direction when they weren't sure. expecting that. Was that something that you can? You, you yes, we out? can. Uh, yeah, we we have we have sort of you know statistics and graphs that, that support the the lack of correlation. Mm. And I think you know this is something that people are are more interested in now because, of course, particularly as far as equity investment has been for the last few years, bar that sort of fairly short lived dip when uh, the pandemic uh, started. Um, otherwise, over the last decade or so, pumped up by quantitative easing, you know, public equity markets in particular have been on a pretty steady uphill uh, trajectory. Um, and it's only recently, and obviously with the, the, the terrible news from Ukraine, um, that we are starting to see some significant volatility. Uh, and people are perhaps feeling, especially if they're sort of getting towards the end of their careers and they're thinking in terms of retirement, actually, do we want everything in the equity markets, uh, which probably is where people have ended up being quite overweight in recent years. Mm. I think the sort of investors we are talking to, because this isn't a, a mass market opportunity, mm. this is for probably the same sorts of investors that Louise and Tom are talking to. Uh, regard, it's, it's effectively an alternative asset class. It is quite complicated. Uh, there is quite a lot of paperwork to be done. And there's some quite sort of, you know, there's some not insignificant setup costs early on. And this mm. is why we see this as, again, a sort of five-year minimum uh, opportunity and ideally longer, mm. uh, particularly if you're looking at coming into this perhaps as a family group uh, as a long-term investment opportunity. But certainly the diversification, the lack of correlation is a big, big selling point for Lloyds. And there is a tax advantage as well. I mean, perhaps you could just explain like, how that might come. Um, yeah. Might work. Certainly. So, so the, the key, the key thing is quite, is, you know, I'm not a tax uh, expert by any means, but is the fact that again, after two years, it is free of inheritance tax. Um, it qualifies for business relief and therefore is exempt after two years. This is not something that is widely known. Um, and certainly, you know, I, I would caveat this by saying we don't market this as an IHT product. Mm. We don't say people should be doing it on that basis, but it is another aspect to investing at Lloyd's. And as I was saying just earlier, you know, this is quite a, uh, a significant undertaking. But if you are possibly a family group looking at putting together a vehicle as part of your strategy for transitioning wealth down to the next generation, Lloyd's may well be something worth considering uh, alongside various other opportunities as well. And do you find that investors come to you with a knowledge of the insurance market already? I, you know, they're, they're partly... Um, prepared and they have some knowledge around around this investment or people come to you with a blank canvas who notice it as a way of generating that diversification lack of correlation what's what's your experience i'd say i'd say it's quite a mix i mean certainly there are a good number of people uh in um you know in the insurance world who obviously it, it's very familiar to them and they understand lloyd's and how it works um equally i'd say we do have a good number of um, individuals, maybe from the city background, perhaps legal accountancy, or maybe the investment world, um, a number from sort of the alternative investment world, because I think they understand the, you know, the, the benefits of the lack of correlation with other asset classes, and also the, uh, you know, the sort of complexity and the fact that this is a, is a long-term opportunity. And they see it, I think, very much in the same terms as they would a private equity uh, or, or a hedge fund or perhaps a property transaction. Um, so I'd say quite a mix. I think certainly if you look at some of our historic clients who we've had for many, many years, 
in many cases, they don't really come from a financial background because in those days, I think Lloyd's was just seen as a fairly mainstream activity. I think where it's moved to now uh, tends to appeal to people who've got greater probably financial sophistication um, and really can understand that, you know, the risks uh, that, that are involved, but also the potential returns too. Okay, many thanks for that. Um, just coming to a close now at the end of this hour, I'm just going to come to each of the panellists for a closing comment, takeaway, thought, observation across the course of this hour, and just uh, come to Tom Lawrence uh, first for a closing thought or comment. Uh, Tom, what, what do you think? Uh, well, I mean, uh, nothing specific, but just the, the general comment that I think while it's not absolutely for everyone it definitely is needs the right kind of client but I think in, more clients ought to think about this kind of alternative investing as a means of diversifying their portfolios um, and yeah the, otherwise I echo the comments of the others. Okay thank you. Um, Bethan any closing comments or thoughts as we wrap up this uh, this hour of discussion? Um, yeah just that uh, uh, it's been really interesting to hear from from the kind of investment side um, and and actually to see how much that echoes with what we're seeing on the legal side um and to stress that you know taking taking advice from people like louise and tom and and richard before you enter into investments or or receive investments is and me of course um <laughs> is very important and i think that it's it's a really interesting space in the market um and it's interesting to see how it's growing and the potential it's got Terrific. It's definitely developing a pace. Thank you for your, very much for your insight today. Um, Louise, any closing comments, thoughts, something to leave people with today? Well, I'm going to pass the baton for advice back to Beth then, definitely. <laughs> you know, thank heaven there are people out there who understand all these compl complex uh, structures and arrangements because they're certainly very useful to investors. Um, uh, no, I, I just think it's, you know, it's it's really echoing what other people have said, you know, with 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 markets as they are and rates as they are you know investors you know should be looking for a sensible allocation to to private markets and um and, and certainly there are lots of very accessible ways of getting involved right um richard just uh people should have a look at insurance and just challenge their own preconceptions around uh, how they can access this. Well, I, I think I think we would like people to sort of move on from thinking of Lloyd's as something that lost people money many years ago, but actually it's really a very different piece these days. I think a lot of wealth management these days is very standardised, and I think for the right people, all of the opportunities you've heard about today, for the right people, are, are worth considering. And the fact is that information is much more available now and we're much more open and approachable about this sort of thing than possibly was once the case. So it's not a mystery. You know, do come and chat. Terrific. Well, look, thanks for joining us today. Thank you to the panel uh, for that fascinating insight. Hope you enjoyed the conversation and I wish you a very good afternoon.